Father God, I do thank you, Lord, today. Lord, this is this is going to be fun, Lord, because it's different than what we have done. And Lord, as we jump into this today, may we just know your hand and your desire and your heart to get the word of God, Lord. And we thank you for all you're doing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, I'm being recorded. I have a microphone. I have a speaker. I have a share. I have the TV on. I don't think I did anything wrong today, which is kind of scary. Mm -hmm. I do. And it's even on hold, so it won't, it won't get turned off accidentally. Wow. I'm scaring myself. Doing it right. Well, let's just figure out something here. Because we have had 21 weeks of epigenosis. <laughs> that's that's a long time. That's three and a half months. And it's been pretty intense and it's been been good stuff, but it's been been packed. So we decided to take a little bit of a different turn here. I am very careful with how I'm saying this because my wife will throw things at me if I'm not. I mean, so far she has proven that to be holding my me accountable for my words. So. <laughs> Is this going to be as deep as the epigenosis one? Possible. It's possible because everything's possible when we start talking about the Word of God. But we're going to do something kind of different, okay? And um, so as we start this new series, I have no idea how long it's going to be. I have no clue. It's not going to be super long. So, so what we are going to be doing is... We are going to be studying the book of Jude. We're going to do a little expository, exegetical romp through the massive book of Jude. And uh, it's, it's small but mighty, okay? So uh, <laughs> this was a suggestion from the peanut gallery to do this. So this is... A suggestion from somebody out there amongst you. So this is not my fault. This one is. So I better not mention him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you you would be wrong if you thought it was her. That's so sad. It's not her. So there. Ah! <laughs> We're gonna have some fun with this because it is a very interesting book. Okay. So let's talk about some foundational information, okay? Who in the world is Jude? Now, this is kind of a fun little study because nobody really knows for absolute positive everything, okay? So there's a lot of speculation here. But Jude, it does say Jude, in the very first verse says Jude, brother of James. Now we got that, okay? Which Jude and James is this? Yeah, exactly. Okay? This is where it gets kind of interesting, okay? It is almost all of the Bible study teachers agree that he's the one that is a half-brother half to Jesus. This is not the James and John that are the disciples, James and John. Not that James, okay? But the other James. Now, it gets kind of interesting because they're in Matthew 13 and another couple other passages. It lists who the brothers are of Jesus. And there's James and Joseph or Joseph, Simon and Judas. And it says, and his sisters are among us. So Mary had, you know, she had at least seven kids. Okay, so that's because it does say sisters, plural. So four plus two plus Jesus is seven. So if they had another girl in there, there could have been eight. Could have been nine. I don't know. We have no idea. We just know that also, and as we talk about some of these, this James, that his, his brother James, is the James who wrote the book of James. Okay? So this makes it interesting. Okay? These guys are, are tied, tied in. Um, Jude seems to have a very firm connection with Simon Peter. 
Okay, they have some things together, and it shows up in their books. Okay, so Second Peter looks like it inspired the writing of this book. Now, we had spent a little time in Second Peter recently. <laughs> no. no, say it isn't so. No, <laughs> and so as we go reading this, it's kind of funny how many similarities there are between these two books. Okay, <laughs> so. When was it written? Well, it was written after Peter's death, but before Jerusalem. But that's only as far as we can kind of speculate. Nobody really knows exact dates on when Jude was written. Okay? What do you mean before Jerusalem? Before the fall of Jerusalem. Oh, okay. The fall of Jerusalem. Before, before 70. Okay? So... But with Peter, Jude was concerned about a certain topic. And that topic was about apostasy. And so 2 Peter and Jude are both really heavily pushing towards saying there's some real problems in the body of Christ. There's some people heading towards apostasy. Now, <laughs> you can, any commentary anybody wants to throw in on that one is it why is that any different than what we're dealing with today okay we are still and so this is a very timely thing for us to be <laughs> running through this okay so I guess, like now it feels like yeah I could kind of expect it that early in the early church It'd be like, why? <laughs> yeah, because they're still trying to establish a foundation on stuff, and so everybody was pulling their two cents worth, and it was getting all sorts of screwy. Okay, so frustration. Yeah, but the question comes that if you look at the at the list of the apostles and the twelve disciples, there's a Jude in there also, a Judas that is not Iscariot, and. There's a James in there. Okay? So both that Jude and James, being the brothers of Jesus, would they also have been disciples? Well, there's a possibility of that. Okay? But who's he talking about? He's talking about Jude and James also being parts of the disciples. Okay? Now, that doesn't make things awkward, does it? <laughs> okay? To have your family in on your discipling. Okay, yeah, it does. It makes things just a little bit different. Okay? Um, some contend that he is Judas, surnamed Labius or Thaddeus. Now, this gets kind of fun for me because, I don't know, there's, the more I studied it, the more, then the more I realized that everybody's pretty confused about this. Nobody really knows. Okay? Um, it is kind of funny that Thaddeus has shown up in my life a couple times recently if this is Thaddeus. Why? Because Thaddeus was also dispatched according to early writings and historical people and um, Josephus and I'm trying to remember the name of the other guy good old Usher Cephas <laughs> I don't, can't remember his name all of a sudden another th um, th uh, historian, hi historian that said that Thomas, the disciple Thomas, dispatched Thaddeus to go to King Abgar. Now there's a huge mythological thing going on here. We know, I mean through all the writings, we have good information that um, Abgar was needing healing. And Thaddeus was sent to him um, to talk to him about Jesus and this is all really pretty cool okay when before the fall of Jerusalem okay before Jerusalem was taken out um, this is a lot of writings about the people in Turkey and through there in Abgar now I'll bring this up because I'll show you that I'm not I'm not nervous about bringing this stuff up but this is one of those little things that I have a little bit of a hard time with and that is some of the writings about the history of Abgar the fifth and him calling or asking for healing is that they said that he had sent a letter to Jesus. 
Okay, we don't have a lot of information on this, but one of the sources says that Jesus wrote him back and they have the letter. I have a hard time with that. I can't prove or verify that. Okay. Uh, with all the Catholicism that hangs around this kind of stuff, you'd think that that letter would be venerated. If there was a letter from Jesus, there would have been, I don't know. But I've read it. I'm not convinced. Okay. But the part of the, the myth of the Abgar thing is that what did he send with Thaddeus to Abgar to prove who Jesus was? It was the shroud. That's why this thing has come up again to me because Thaddeus was known as being the one who carried the shroud to King Abgar. Where was Abgar? He was in Edessa. That is, ends up being the place where the shroud was stored for a couple hundred years. Okay? And is even one of the names of the shroud is called the image of Edessa. So, <laughs> this all starts mixing in together. Okay, could he have sent the, the shroud up there? Yes. Could it have given proof that Jesus had been raised, risen from the dead? It works for me. Okay, the shroud does work for me. So, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, the only thing about this story that bothers me is the letter from Jesus. I can't verify that. Everything else has a lot of historical stuff with it. Is this the Jude that is surnamed or is also named Thaddeus. Could be. Okay? I don't know. I don't know. But uh, there's a lot of this. The, I, I had a lot of different stuff this week. <laughs> Just really going over it, which is really kind of fascinating. So, um, um, But one thing Jude did not do is he didn't promote himself as being the half-brother of Jesus. Okay? He didn't do that. The other thing he didn't do was he didn't promote whether he was an apostle or not. Neither of those seemed to be something that was important for him. He wasn't trying to credentialize. He just knew that, okay, Jude, and as you'll see in the first verse, what does he call himself? A slave of Jesus Christ. Brother of James. That to me thrills me more than if he had said anything else. Because he was humble. He says, no, I'm just a slave of Jesus Christ. Brother of James, if you need to know. Now, remember, the James and John James was killed early. He was one of the first martyrs. Okay? So who was the James who was in charge of the church? That was the guy that they all went and I, I met with James and I met with all this. That's this James. Okay? The guy that wrote James. Okay, so there's there's lots of neat stuff about who James is and who Jude is, and all I can tell you is these guys were heavily involved because their lives were changed. Okay, right. they met Jesus Christ and then they saw him after he was raised, and they were given the Holy Spirit internally and after the day of Pentecost externally. Okay, so either way, these guys were changed. That was the big, big deal, okay? The biggest thing that Jude wanted was he wanted the church to pay attention. He wanted them to pay attention. Think about this. Think of what's going on. Guys, you've got you to get in on this, okay? Heresy was rampant in the church because everybody wanted to be part of this new thing and nobody knew much. There's no letters. Why do you think all the Bibles, all the rest of the Bible was written? Is to, to firm things up and make things solid about what is true and not because there is all sorts of different stuff. Because remember, even Paul even had to confront Peter because he was taken away with being thought that you had to be Jewish again. Mm -hmm. We had to go back into Judaism. Okay? And he was taken away for a while with a heresy. And Paul confronted him and took care of that. Okay? So they needed the letters. They needed the, the epistles to firm up things and to solidify the belief systems and what people were knowing and understanding to which I am eternally and internally grateful Amen. we get the Bible okay this is awesome okay because you know me and my little uh, love affair with the Word of God okay I, I like the fact that this all is there but Jude is very succinct and to the point yes. <laughs> He doesn't dink around. He doesn't take 14 chapters to say it. He just pretty much throws it all in one pile. And there it is, okay? 
So, without any further ado, now we got kind of the context of who the writer of this thing is. Let's just jump right into the Word of God and look at Jude chapter 1, verse 1. And I really do not need to say Jude 1, 1 because there's only one chapter. If I put Jude 1 up there, it would work. It would suffice. But I'm being nice to everybody. Since when, right? <laughs> Come on. Okay. I try to be nice once in a while, whether I need it or not. Okay, Jude 1.1 1, 1 says this. Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to the ones called in God the Father, having been set apart and have been kept to Jesus Christ. Huh? Okay, he says three things here to prove that he is writing to Christians. He is writing to the church, okay? The truth of who he is. He gave the proper attitude. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. Um, there's a book over here that's blue. It's called God's Design for Relationships. I know the author, kind of a strange person, but I, hey, I think what he writes is awesome. So uh, <laughs> Anyway, the first whole chapter is how to view yourself. And the whole thing is about as long as we keep saying, I'm a, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a whatever, you'll go astray. You'll, you'll think strongly in the wrong directions. But you finally get it down to, I'm a slave, you'll get it right. Okay? So the truth of who he is, it's the proper attitude. So he's writing to Christian believers. And how do I know this? He says, because all that is needed. To understand that is established right here in this first, first very bit. Okay, the description of his target audience is thorough. He he doesn't just say one per, one way of determining who it is. He gives us three. Okay, so let's look at them. To the ones called, Greek word kletos. Oh, by the way, if you're not into the Greek language, tough noogies, you're going to get a lot of it today. Okay. Because we're going yeah, to we're going to compound this thing down. We're actually going to be doing a men's Bible study very quickly. <laughs> this is what we do on Monday nights. Okay, breaking down these words, but we're going to do this really quickly for you. But to the ones called the Kletos, okay, um, it's a condition of fact. Now that's what's true about all of these. The ones called, it is in the perfect present participle if I remember correctly. And it means something that was done in the past with continuing results. Called. I was called back then, and I am still called to this day. Okay, called. We have hit calling in almost every single series we've done somewhere along the line. Almost every one of them has talked about being called and called and called and called and called. And called. The biggest thing about being called is that it takes a voice to call. You have to have heard the voice of the shepherd to know you're calling. Okay. Uh, in last series, it says that you're calling, make sure of your calling and election. Because if you do that, you'll never ever fall. So the idea about your calling is a huge deal. Are you called? Yes. Well, I'm not called to full time ministry. Yes, you are. Full time, not full pay. <laughs> I had to make that distinction early on in my understanding because um, yeah you are called to, to be full time Christian what part of the day are you not to be a Christian as long as you're breathing you're called to be a Christian what what was that breakfast breakfast <laughs> not called to be a Christian before the coffee <laughs> Probably called then more than ever, okay? <laughs> I'll just let that ride. <laughs> okay. Called. Then he says something else. To those who are sanctified. What? Hagiadzo. Really? What's this word? Well, this is the same word for holiness. Okay. What is a sanctified person, a person made holy? Well, we're right back at that perfect present participle. Okay? It was something that was done to you with continuing results. 
Okay? I have been made sanctified. Now, this last week, it was fun to go over that, you know, we need to be sanctified. What's God's will? What's God's purpose? What's He doing? He is sanctifying us. You know, may the God of peace Himself sanctify you. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless in the presence of the Lord. This whole thing about being sanctified is huge deal. Well, sanctified, and then it says, may your whole spirit, soul, and body. Being sanctified in spirit is a piece of cake. Done deal. Took an instant. When you got born again, your whole spirit was sanctified. So he can say that here. You've been made sanctified with lasting results. True enough. But the whole rest of the book, he's hammering on the church to prove their sanctification in their soul and in their actions. True. Okay. Good. And, so, Good and so here we are. He says, you've been made sanctified. Okay. And which is true in their spirit. Now we have the responsibility to complete the action. <laughs> okay, Take this thing another step. We are called to be sanctified. Okay, Very, very cool. And then he says, kept. He says, those who are kept. Greek word tereo means to keep or to guard from loss or injury. Well, that's pretty cool. Okay, and we'll, we'll hit that verse again to show you where those are again. But God has done all the work with lasting results. He says to those who are the ones who are called, sanctified, and kept. Now, that's you. See, you've been called. You've been sanctified. And you've been kept. So, this is Jude writing to you. You can't get more personal than this. This is If you qualify in all three of those qualifications, then this book is written toward you, Roxanne. All right. <laughs> Reminding them of where they stand in the world. Okay. Now, I, I didn't, but I'm going to, I'm going to back up real quick here so we can look at that verse again. It says, Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to the ones called, there's a kletos, in God the Father. This is given, by the way, God the Father as part of the workings that we're working with. It's, it's not just working with Jesus, we're working with the Father. Having been set apart, having been sanctified, there's the set apart, is the hagiazo. And having been kept to Jesus Christ. There's the Tereo. Okay. It is fun. See, just one verse at a time. Kind of you know, look. You like the only dots in one verse. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know that you could possibly do Jude chapter 1, verse 1 as a single verse for Roxa. You really could. You could. It's a you deal. really, really could. I'm not going to, but you could. You really could. Mm -hmm. I really should. Well, did I go too quick? Do I need to go back? Mm -hmm. Everybody okay? Okay. So then we're going to go into Jude 1 2. What was the last sentence? Sorry. Okay. Not that one. The other. The next one. Yeah. Everybody good? <laughs> I have to notice the little danglies on the back of her little hairpins, and when they dingle the right way, then I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sad when you have to watch your little danglies before you know. All right. <laughs> okay. Jude chapter 1, verse 2. <laughs> Screaming along here. Okay. Mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. That's the whole verse. Now, do you remember Second Peter chapter 1? 
where it said, Grace and peace be multiplied to you mm-hmm. through what? Oh, thank you. See, I love this woman. See? I do too. <laughs> we saved our bacon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay, grace and peace and love be multiplied to you. When he's saying, okay, guys, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Mercy and peace and love be multiplied. What a wonderful beginning. This is the language of blessing. Notice he is promoting something to somebody. He is being, saying something and applying it to people's lives by speaking it into existence. Isn't that the language of blessing? Mm-hmm. Mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. That's language of blessing. All these can be proven to be in the Spirit. Every one of them. Have you received mercy? Yes. In your spirit? Absolutely. Peace? Absolutely in my spirit. Love? Totally, in my spirit. All these things can be proven to be in the spirit. But he is blessing them with the experience and the acknowledging of them. Okay? Mm. He's blessing them with this stuff, showing them, okay, you guys are believers. I've given you three whole areas to prove that you are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm giving you three whole areas of benefit of how this has been in you. And you need to experience the mercy, not just in your spirit. And you need to experience the peace, not just in your spirit. And you need to experience the love, not just in your spirit. Why? Because he says, be multiplied to you. Uh-huh. To go further than the spirit. That's right. To the soul. Absolutely. So let's look at those words just a little bit here. Mercy. Greek word, eleos. Eleos. And you will get extremely familiar with this word coming up. Just want to let you know, this is a very big word. Mercy means you don't get what you do deserve. Now, if somebody's out there, mercy. Somebody's about ready to shoot their brains out. Right? Mercy. Getting ready to hang them. Mercy. Getting ready to do something. Just mercy. Why do we ask for mercy? That's usually because it has been determined that you're going to get killed. Something has been determined against you. And you're asking a change so you don't get what you do deserve. Even you may not deserve it. You deserve it in the minds of the person who is going to kill you. You're asking for mercy. You're asking for them to not do something bad to you. This is a big deal. Mercy is that way. Now, what's the difference between mercy and grace? Grace means you're getting something that you don't deserve. Mercy is you're not getting what you do deserve. Man, this is amazing. What do we deserve? We deserve hell. Okay? And not getting that means we have huge mercy. God is not sending us to hell. That's a huge mercy. Man, that makes that word kind of massive. Okay? <laughs> uh, I just had five thoughts run through my brain. That's going to give you for later. Okay, so that was good. Thank you, Lord. That was really good. Huh. <laughs> okay, I'm just setting it in a file. There we go. Mercy that God has given us is a huge, huge deal. Okay? So when he says mercy being multiplied to you, the mercy that I got is going to take me the rest of my life to understand. Mm -hmm. Okay? Did I need mercy this last week from God? (laughs) Uh, Yeah! I ought to say yes. Okay? So, this mercy being multiplied means what? It wasn't just the mercy that happened in my spirit. This is also mercy. Lord, I need mercy in my soul. I need mercy the way I think. I need mercy the way I want. I need mercy in the way I I feel. I need your mercy to help me. That puts me in the right position. And again, the idea of being a slave is what makes that whole thing work and is possible. You don't get what you do deserve. Then comes the next word. Greek word, Irene. 
You ever known anybody by the name of Irene? Mm -hmm. That's what her name means, is peace. Mm -hmm. Irene, peace. Now peace is also a topic that we could do a whole series on. Easy, easy. Okay? It's so much more than just the lack of turmoil. That's what people think of peace when they think of peace. They just think, nothing's messing with me at this point. Lack of turmoil means there's peace. Is that peace? Or is peace something a lot bigger? So for me to understand peace and have it applied to my life in my soul, not just what happened in my spirit from before, but now it's mercy and peace being multiplied over and over and over. Man, how much do we need to know the peace? Well, Second Thessalonians says it's the God of peace himself working to sanctify you. Okay. Oh, there's more to that than can be touched. Okay, that's, that's a huge deal. So much more than just the lack of turmoil. And since we're just doing light and fluffy subject matters, let's bring up agape. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's love. Now, but look how I put that. This is the love that is who God is. God is agape. God is love. So for me to practically apply love, that means I'm going to have to practically apply God and get more revelation knowledge of who He is. Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the revelation knowledge. Can you say that again? That again. <laughs> so... <laughs> God is, God, God is love. So for us to get more of who God is, we have to gain more relationship of who He is. Okay, there's your epigenosis. That's learning more about who God is. So that, because the more you get to know who God is, the God who is love, and the God who is light, and the God who is spirit, God is, the more we're going to understand. God, love, that is who God is, love, the agape. And no, I can't explain it. But I can't live without it. True. You know, I, the more I try to explain agape, the, <laughs> the more I just, I come up short, okay, on what love is. I just, it's a, it's a, it's a big deal. But when it says grace and peace be multiplied to you in the revelation knowledge, well, this is mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Multiplied. Gaining epigenosis over and over again. Over and over and over and over and more and more and more and more. Now this is going to show up in here because of his subject matter and how he's going to be talking about this. Okay? <laughs> God. Four women in the room, and all four pens are just just flying across paper. This is pretty good. <laughs> you should know they're paying attention. Yes, they are, and it helps me know when I can start going again. When the pens stop, and they look at me like, "Well, get it on." Okay, here we are. <laughs> Now they're comparing notes. Now this is going to be bad. All right, here we go. <laughs> Chapter 3. <laughs> Verse 3. <laughs> Did you get it together there? Okay. I was missing the word and it was driving me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I get it. Verse 3. Can we make it through the third verse? Okay. <laughs> Having made all haste to write to you about the common salvation, beloved, I had need to write to you to exhort you to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints. Obviously, there's a lot in there. Okay. Having made all haste. Pos, all, and spude. Now, we've heard spude a few times. All diligence. It's usually used in Second Peter as 
diligence. It uses that a couple times in that first in Second Peter chapter one passage. With all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and add in your virtue knowledge. And your, okay, and then in all diligence, okay, towards the end, okay, supplying all this. Okay, so there's a real diligence thing here. Well, Peter and Jude both had this little focus on this diligence thing. And he says, having made all diligence, this is something that I see as vastly important, okay, to write to you about the common salvation. There's nothing common about this salvation, right? If you look at it in value, but that's not what he's talking about. Common is koinos. Anybody know what word we get koinos koinonia which means fellowship communion participation koinonia the commonness okay common salvation we all share yes very much something we do all share um koinos and soteria okay which is salvation okay a salvation we all have in common now this this is the great equalizer it doesn't matter who's rich, who's poor, who's old, who's young, who's male, who's female, who's anything, anything. It doesn't matter. This is the common salvation. Everybody needs to be saved. He says, I, I just, with all diligence, I needed to write to you about this common salvation. Because this common salvation that we're writing to you has been attacked. And there's going to be problems about what is being said out there because there are people coming in who are just messing things up he says no I'm gonna I had to I just had to write to you about this common salvation beloved I just had to and he says I had need to write to you and to exhort okay I had need echo and ananke which is a really nice word to use. It says, I had the need, I held the need to write to you. I, this word there, by the way, I had need, is two words in the Greek. Okay? I had the need, I was constrained to. It was so strong, this need, that I was constrained to write to you, to exhort you. Okay? I had the need. Now, I want you to hear his heart. He couldn't last any longer. He had to. He really had the constraint. He, I made all haste to talk about this thing because I had the need. I had a need to exhort you. Word for exhort, pericoleo. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think she got it. Pericoleo. Anybody know where, what that's coming from? Paraclete. Paraclete. Mm. To call alongside to help. Okay. I had need to write to you because I'm going to come alongside you. I'm going to help you. I am going to help you because you guys have an issue. And I have decided with all the hell haste to write to you about the common salvation. But I needed to write to you to exhort you. I need you to get this together. I need you to figure out what's going on here. Okay. Then we have the fun. I, all that was preliminary to bring us to this one. Okay. To exhort you to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints. To contend earnestly. Ep, ag, ep agonizo. Agonizo. Ep agonizo. Agonizo is a word we're going to be getting more about here. But then he made it epi. Oh no. So you got to get the root word to figure out what the epi is going to make it. So the agonizomai is a Greek word that means to fight, contend, struggle with something. Fight, contend, or struggle with something. Now, looking these up has been really kind of interesting. Because, no, we're not going to just stick in Jude and say, I can't go anywhere else because I'm going to show you some other verses. Because uh, I want you to see how this word is used. Okay. So in John, chapter 18, verse 36, it says this. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Pilate. He says, If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have fought that I might not be delivered up to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from here. We're not doing the things 
you guys do. We're doing the things we do. Now, this is massively important. Okay? He said this to Pilate. Now, Pilate understood fighting. He was a Roman procreator. Okay? So, he knew fighting. He knew soldiers. He knew warfare. He knew this. And then Jesus says, he says, are you a king? Well, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not a kingdom. It's an epi kingdom. Okay? He could have used that word. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then we'd be working according to the dictates of the normal common things that happen in this world. But my kingdom is not of this world. We're not fighting for this. We're not having wars. We're not trying to kill people. We're not trying to get armament. What are we trying for? He says, oh, this is a whole different thing. whole different thing. He says, my servants would have fought that I might be not delivered up to the Jews. But now my kingdom, that's not from here. This just blew Pilate's mind. He says, oh, I'm playing with something here that is bigger than I am. How do we know this? He tried his hardest to get Jesus set free. Mm -hmm. And they put him in a position where he had to, according to Caesar, do something because they had said, are you going to follow Caesar or not follow Caesar? Got a good beat to it, but it's kind of slow. Anybody know whose car that is by any chance? The lights usually flash, so you should be able to see something. Nope. Oh. Somebody finally found it. Okay. But Pilate knew that there was something different here. He had to, because he, he was put in a position of following Caesar. You know, follow Caesar or not. Mm -hmm. So he was... He was limited. He had to do what they were saying. So he turned him over. They couldn't crucify Jesus. Only Pilate could. So he had Jesus crucified. How do I know that he regretted that or he did something? Because when they found out that Jesus was dead, when um, Joseph of Arimathea came to him and said, I want the body. The body of crucified people were not to be given to people to be buried. Because crucified people, that was part of their punishment, that they were completely scum. And they were to be thrown their bodies, not honored, but thrown into the trash. Wow. Ugh. And then, what did Pilate do? He, he said, no, he gave the body of Jesus to Joseph of Arimathea because he knew he was to be honored. He says, I may have to crucify him, but I don't have to throw him in the trash. Wow. That's huge. It is huge. It's a big deal. Okay? So he knew there was something different here. He says, is he a king? Oh, God. Am I in trouble? I don't know. Am I going to start another war here? What's the deal? I don't, he, had, he didn't know what he was doing. It scared him because it was more than he had ever seen. Okay? And also, his wife had a dream. Yeah. No. I was thinking it was his wife that killed him in. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There was a lot of different things going on. Boy, you're padding your part on this one, aren't you? Just the old wife. <laughs> hey, God put them in there. God put them yes, this. God, God gave us wives. Hallelujah. Praise God. And most are saying, Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Okay. But that's, that's one way. The fighting is not the same fighting. Now, this is why when Jude says, I want you to fight for this, he is telling them, we're not fighting physical fight. We're not fighting this, that kind of war. I want you to fight. But it's going to be the right kind of fighting, okay? How about in Second Tim or First Timothy chapter six, verse twelve says this? Paul says, "Fight the good fight of faith." What? Lay hold on eternal life, to which you are also called. Here's the called, and confess the good confession before many witnesses. Okay, fight the good fight of faith. He's not telling him to go out and punch somebody in the face. He's not telling them to go out and get and get armament, stockpile bullets. What's he saying? Fight the good fight of faith. Take this out of the natural into the supernatural. We're fighting a different fight. Okay? We don't fight others as it is in the natural world. No. Where is my fight? My fight is within me. So 
So Jude is going to be saying this very same thing. He says, I want you to contend for the faith. I want you to fight for the faith. Where? Inside you and how it affects the people around you and what's going to happen with it. My fight is within me. Okay? Then Paul says here, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you are also called and confess the good. Lay hold. Interesting that he would use that word. What is that word? Epi lambanomai. Okay? Lambano means to take, to get a grip on, to do something and take it to yourself. Take it. Now we're taking it out of the natural into the supernatural. Epi take this thing. Epi hold onto eternal life. Take this thing out of the natural into the supernatural. To which you're also called. Get a grip on this thing in the spirit realm. I think I just said that. Get a grip on the supernatural life and salvation. Yeah. Get an epi grip. Now I want you to, to keep your eye on that epi lambano mind because I think it's going to come up again, but in a different way. We're having fun so far? It's good. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Is Jude going to work out? This is going to be fun. Mm -hmm. Okay. 2 Timothy 4 7. Yeah, see, some of you kind of know where I'm heading with this one. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Paul fought to know and live the faith immediately. I fought the good fight. I am fighting that fight. Where was that fight? The fight was within him. It wasn't other people. I fought the good fight. I am continuing to live, pursuing to live the way Jesus would have me live in front of everybody else around me. I'm fighting the good fight. I am doing it right. I'm getting in there. Um, Rick Renner translates this as, A fight, I fought me a good one. A race, I finished me one. The faith, I kept it. I like, I just, it, I can't verify why you would do that, but it was really, I like it. It's very, uh, very uh, hmm. uh, dramatic. <laughs> okay. He fought to grip the supernatural in extreme value. Okay. You ready for this? Fought the good fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. He epilambanomide, to, to epigrip, to seize something, to get a grip, and he goes on in that passage about getting a grip on the supernatural life and salvation. You're all staring at the screen, you're not writing, so I don't know when you're done. Okay? <laughs> Are you ready? If I click again, I, I, that's, that's it. You're all, you're all toast. Okay? <laughs> I see. I I see one who's still <laughs> she's making faces at the screen. That's not good. <laughs> okay, you good to go? Okay. Wow. Gee, Nate, when you're not here, your wife does fun things. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Philippians three twelve. Because she waits for me to do all the crazy things. Oh. <laughs> See, all, all this time we thought she was the, the sane one, but now, hey, okay. <laughs> but we should have known she married you. She can't be totally sane. Here we go. Philippians 3.12 says this. Not that I have already received or already been perfected, but I press on, if also I may lay hold inasmuch as I was also laid hold of by Jesus Christ. The word for fight is not in there. The actual word. But the attitude is. Okay. I press on. Fighting for the supernatural gold. And what's this laid hold of word that he uses here? Ah. Kata lambano. Mm. Not epi lambano. Epi lambano is in the spirit realm. Kata lambano is to take grip on something but take it down. To seize it completely. That I may also lay hold in as much as I was laid hold of by Christ. See, that lambano word is a good word to take, to grip. To grip it down, to grip it into the spirit realm, to grip it, boy, get a grip. Okay, that's a good word. It's the natural fighting. 
is hardly a true fight. Okay? This thing about the war in Ukraine and all the fighting that's going on there, that's, that's fighting. But man, that's not the fight we're called to. We're called to a fight that is constant day in and day out every minute of the day. Yeah. True. How you doing on your fight? <laughs> some days I'm the hammer and some days I'm the nail. Some days I'm a bug and some days I'm the windshield. I don't know. It's just like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Fight the fight that means something for all of eternity. And this is exactly what he was telling Pilate. He says, <laughs> this stuff? Yeah, it can only last for a while. But man, I'll tell you something. What I'm fighting for is an eternal thing. It's a way long further. Okay. So, epagonizo. Agonizo. To contend earnestly. We had talked about agonizo mai. To fight and contend. Now, this is exactly from before the screen we'd already talked about. Okay. But Jude needed them to see the true value of life. He needed them to see, quit dinking around with stuff that's not, not functional. We need to go into the greater, greater things. Not the fake fighting that fights others. I want you to get it on. That's the fake fighting that others want you to get in on. But this is a real fight, not the fake fight. The fight of faith is to be the most important thing. Okay, now... Just in case everybody's wondering, well, does this mean we're fighting for the faith, which means the religion? Hey, that's what I was taught growing up. We're in contending for this faith. We're contending for being Baptist. Mm-hmm. We're contending for being Christians, and all of a sudden, and I'm, I, I always, I didn't understand that. I mean, I kind of did. I was a militant Baptist. Okay, I was kind of like, you know, we're the only ones, and we're going, you know. We fought everybody. That was all good. But then to come to find out, that's not the fight he's talking about. To contend for your faith. To contend to gain faith. To know who you are, what's going on. It's a completely different lifestyle of eternal beings. Let's fight for the faith. For the faith to be in you. For the faith to be the thing that you need, you want. This has nothing to do with religion. Which means, what exactly? Well, I'm not being distracted by stupid things and sin. Now, this is exactly what Jude is working on. Contend for the faith. Fight to keep what you have that is perfect in the common salvation to get it worked out, to get it something that you are doing all the time. Don't, don't get sucked into the stupid stuff. Anybody here ever get distracted? <laughs> nah. nah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's exactly what Jude is talking about. It's just contend for the faith. Fight for it. Keep in there and keep in the fight. Okay. Let's go back over this a little bit. Jude one three. Having made all haste. I am with every bit of diligence within me to write to you about the common salvation. I had need. I must. I needed to write to you, to exhort you, to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints, keeping the faith pure and the lifestyle consistent. Why? Because people were trying to distort the gospel. Not that anybody tried to do that today. Oh, heck no. I keep finding more people sucked into heresies, sucked into stupid stuff. It just drives me crazy. And so, like, uh, come on, guys, think. Why are we doing these things, okay? So they were defiling the message. There are certain people who are coming along who are defiling the message. They were changing what was true about the gospel and changing it. And Jude, well, he wanted better than that for them.
this setting a good foundation for what we're going to be doing with Jude. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So, just like today, many distractions, many different heresies, many things pulling us in many directions. Okay. <laughs> Did I use many there many times? Okay. <laughs> we need a foundational stability. You know, nobody's going to be able to tell me to suck away from the things of Jesus. And every now and then I'll, I'll come across somebody that says, says, well, this new teaching is this. Okay, well, let's think about it. Let's examine it. What's it doing? If it's not making me closer to Jesus, then I'm having a problem with it. If it's because somebody has gained a vision of something and he's preaching his vision and not preaching the Bible, he can take his vision and head off to Starbucks. I don't care. I just, you know, it doesn't. We better have a reality check. We better everything be able to find. Oh, everything should. You know? If you have a vision, it should. Mm -hmm. So to fight for the right things, mm -hmm. to fight for the right things, mm -hmm. and this is this is the the big deal. This is this is where Jude is going. Thanks. Okay, he he says, I find the need. You guys have got to have this. You got to know that you got to contend for the faith. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some fights are worth getting into. I remember in the movie, Last of the Mohicans, they were always discussing, uh, is this a fight you will make? Or is this a fight you're not going to get into? Mm -hmm. yeah. All the time through that movie. Your battles. Yeah. And so many of the guys says, well, I have nothing else to go home to. There's nothing else. He says, I'm going to stay here and fight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is this a fight you want to get into? Hmm. <coughs> Most are only distractions. That's true. So... Use your energy wisely. Fight what is a real fight. So many times somebody wants to talk about something, I just go, nah, it's not worth not worth it. A lot of people who I've I've met want to get into an argument. They're not wanting to find truth. Mm -hmm. They're just wanting to promote what they are doing and they're going to try to bully you into it. And I won't go into those discussions. I'm sorry. If you want to discuss the scripture, we'll, we'll get into it. Okay? But if you're trying to just promote your stupidity, I, I'm, I have better things to do. Even if that better thing is cleaning out my navel from lint. Okay, I'm talking anything is going to be better than that. Okay. So we need to fight the good fight. Amen. Amen. There we have our our new way of determining when we're done for the day. <laughs> A little banner going. Ta -da! <laughs> okay. Okay. So was that fun? Yeah, very good. You see where we're going with this? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's simple. Just simple. Just read the book of Jude. And then you, you're going to say, oh no, mm -hmm. oh no, how long is Lee going to take to do this book? <laughs> hey, uh, you did three verses in one day. I did three verses in one day. Screaming along. <laughs> We're just screaming along. <laughs> Mock two with our hair on fire. Come on. <laughs> That's what happened. See, is that burned it all off? <laughs> My friend used to say, We're off like a herd of turtles. Yep. <laughs> I don't know. Some of them are highly motivated. Have you ever seen a turtle run? Really? Mm -hmm. No. Well, you heard about the snail that was kind of hitching a ride on a turtle, and and they're bopping along, and another turtle run into him, and the, and the cop was asking the snail, and he says, "What happened?" He says, "I don't know. It happened so fast." <laughs> okay. Okay, well, so the idea, as we're going to find out, is that Jude had a real bug in his bonnet about heresy. And when he starts getting into this thing, 
he is pretty upset. So again, for those of you who like to do this a little bit, if you would read Jude with a little bit of an attitude, a little bit of emotion, get a little anger in your voice, and then read it out loud, you probably get it pretty straight, <laughs> which is exactly like I do with uh, Galatians. Read the whole thing just with a, just mad. Just read Galatians tick, and you probably get pretty close to what it, what it was. Mm -hmm. Oh, foolish Galatians! Just, just like this. Well, put that right here into Jude, and he he gets pretty funny. Okay, he gets cranked up. Which is okay. I'll let him get cranked up so I don't have to. Yeah. Uh, I'm seeing if anybody's buying that. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, you just, yeah, okay. Well, anyway. All right. Well, then let's pray. Father God, I thank you for today. And Lord, may we truly hear what you are saying about contending for the faith. Contending, fighting for keeping our lives in line with what you have to fight the flesh, to fight the distractions, to fight the things, and to fight the good fight that we could end up being the kind of people that you've called us to. And Lord, help us as we understand Jude. Lord, give us revelation. Give us understanding of what is going on in this book so we could really, really understand it and bring it to other people. And Lord, for all this, we will give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yes, sir? Any questions? No. Nope. Comments? All right. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to turn off the recorder and then Chuck, don't leave.